It's uh, good to be with you as we get back into our lectures, but also let me remind you as the course is quickly coming to a close uh, that this week especially you work on your uh, rough draft for your Bible storyline, which is your uh, end of the course project that you'll be handing in, uh, your critical assignment as it's described in the syllabus and in the learning activities. So. Uh, make sure you're working on that. Make sure you're keeping up with your weekly assignments as listed on the learning activities. And also just another reminder that week eight, um, week eight ends on Friday. Every other week of the course you've had until Sunday ending through that weekend. Uh, but this course will end on Friday, February 26th. So all of your work except the final exam uh, must be submitted at that time. So make sure you take note of that. That is printed in the syllabus as well as, again, in your learning activities to make sure uh, your weekly scheduled learning activities uh, on your Blackboard. So make sure you uh, take note of all that. Well, let's get to the uh, general epistles, and we'll begin with the letter to the Hebrews. And uh, in the letter to the Hebrews, we see in the introductory material uh, that uh, the author is unknown. It's still, even with uh, scholarly advances to this day, still not known for certain um, who uh, penned the book of Hebrews. Uh, some still would think it was Paul, but um, most even going as far back as the early church fathers uh, don't name with certainty who it was. And so we don't know for certain. Um, and it's dated late, probably mid to late first century. And um, especially in regards to its, its mention, or it seems it assumes that the uh, temple practices are still in place. And the fact that it is given as a word of exhortation. So whoever the writer was, he was very familiar with the old covenant practices, especially in regards to sacrifices. And he was exhorting these new believers about uh, how much greater Christ is in regards. Um, the literary structure alternates between explanation and exhortation. And um, the writer explains the superiority of Christ as uh, an explanation in comparison to the angels and Moses and the high priest. And um, it's vital because this is a key theme throughout the entire book of Hebrews. Uh, but then he also encourages his readers to persevere. So we see the explanation as to Christ and then the exhortation to persevere. Um, also, uh, the basic idea is to warn them not to fall away from their faith. Number one, because their faith is in Jesus, who, as he's already explained, is greater than the angels and uh, Moses and the high priest and even the old covenant institutions, but to rather hold to the faith um, because of the better things that we have in Christ. And so just to quickly walk through the outline of the book, um, as mentioned, Christ's superiority to the angels and uh, the scriptures listed there, Christ's superiority to Moses and Christ's superiority to Aaron as the high priest um, and Christ as the superior priest, a, a, the high priest of a new covenant, and then the call to perseverance with the key coming in um, Hebrews chapter 4. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, uh, we've already read through the connection of that from Robert's um, book on the Bible timeline, where he talks about the rest, even going all the way back to the beginning of creation, where God rested, and he tied that into Hebrews chapter 4. And the fact that that's our rest, holding on to the faith, in regards to what Christ has done and that we not fall short of it by any measure of disobedience. And so that's that's our basis for the call to perseverance and living by faith. And, um, and in fact, there's a whole chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, is called the Hall of Faith, where uh, many of the Old Testament um, examples are held up as people of faith. And then the new covenant that is established in Christ. So it's just an, an excellent uh, piece of literature that describes the fulfillment of Christ doing away with all the things of the old covenant institutions 
and establishing the new covenant in who he is and in what he has done. And so that that uh, is the outline of the book of Hebrews. Next is the letter to James, or the, excuse me, the letter of James uh, to the early church. And just by way of introduction, James, the brother of Jesus, um, also known as James the Just. Uh, he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. You see him mentioned in the Acts chapter uh, 15 church council that took place. Um, probably one of the earlier books written in the mid 40s um, prior to both the Jerusalem Council and James' death, which was in the early 60s. Um, and James is writing to Jewish Christians of whom he and all of the original disciples, original Christians were, to encourage and command them that faith is something that's to be lived out in everyday life. In fact, a key verse in James is that he calls in James 1.22 that we're to be, that Christians are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then he gives a warning about those who hear and don't do of not really uh, knowing the true faith. And so the key themes are this wisdom that is needed to live out our faith, um, the number of imperatives in 108 verses that make up the entire book, there are 50 imperatives, in other words, commands. So he's very straightforward and very direct in telling them what they are to do. Um, but also that we're to live in light of Jesus' second coming. And as a result of that, both the faith that we hold onto in Christ and the life that we live, that's this idea of the relationship between faith and works, that the two go hand in hand. And that to be a follower of Christ there will be evidence in our life. So we're not to just be a doer of what we say we believe, but we're to be someone who lives out our faith, and uh, that should be evident in the life uh, that we live. Uh, so he opens with the greeting, uh, the, the test of faith and call to perseverance in the midst of difficulty, um, the faith and obedience aspect of um, our relationship of not only with God, but in living out um, living out our uh, faith in the reality of the world in which we are in. And then this faith in real life, this faith in regards to personal desires, this faith in regards to relationships, this faith in regards to our future and in regards to finance and in regards to suffering, and then ultimately in prayer. And so we see this um, truly applicable aspect of the book of James in regards to its impact on our daily lives, especially those of us who claim to have faith in Jesus Christ, that the life we live would give evidence to that. And then there's uh, First and Second Peter, two letters uh, from Peter that are that are addressed from Peter. And uh, First Peter deals with uh, with and is by label uh, written by Peter and probably written from Rome and possibly in the early 60s. And the occasion was to help the church understand their identity in Christ and their responsibility to live in the world in the midst of persecution. And that's a key element, especially if Nero, uh, if, if Peter was written at the time that Nero uh, was the emperor because of the persecution uh, that Christians saw. So. Peter's goal was to get them to understand that their perseverance in the midst of persecution could come as a result of the hope of their salvation in Jesus Christ. And so it's, uh, he even opens his book that way, that we're born again to a living hope. And so the themes are seen here as our life lived rightly before Christ's second coming, our um, experience of trials, can be um, endured through, with joy because of our relationship with Christ and that finding our identity should be in Christ and not with the world around us. And so the typical opening and salutation, the identity of the people of God, as I mentioned before in chapter 1, verse 3, he begins by saying, we are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so because of all that Christ has done, uh, we can we can understand not only how precious our salvation is, but that that's what identifies us, and we're identified 
through that calling of living a holy life and a reverent life and a life that represents the love of God uh, that's been given to us. And so we see also the responsibilities as the people of God, um, our mission of God's people in the world to share with others, but also the key to living in this world in regards to how we relate to others, our respect for others, how um, as servants in the first century, but but easily applicable to employees uh, today in regards to those who are over us. Um, James deals with, outside of Paul, uh, Paul's letters, James deals, again, specifically with the relationship between husbands and wives, and then repeats this idea of this theme of respect um, for one another. But also the idea of our vindication, what's, what's going to be that final vindication of our life in Christ is the good that we've done, and especially in suffering for doing the good for the sake of Christ that we've experienced here on this earth, and, and Christ being ultimately vindicated, and that we live for that promise, and that for us in the end times, the key to our community in Christ is our mutual love for one another. And then he touches on the responsibilities of a church and its leadership through the elders, even in the midst of trial. And then he concludes um, with some closing remarks. But in chapter 4, verse 1, Peter touches on this idea that since Christ suffered in the flesh in his earthly body, we too should be ready uh, to uh, face the same thing as we live for Christ. Not that we are Christ and not that our suffering would accomplish the same result that Christ's suffering accomplished, but that as followers of Christ in the midst of the same world, that crucified Christ, we should be ready and prepared to live um, in the suffering of what our faith or our faithfulness to Christ will bring because of the opposition that comes as a result of this world. And then in Second Peter, uh, the second letter attributed to Peter, um, probably about the same time, maybe a little bit later, um, Peter writes, uh, the Christians in uh, the region in this second letter and is talking to them about God's grace as transforming and empowering them to live righteously and to warn them against false teachers who would lead them away from Christ and deny the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was an important concept for the first century believers specifically that their lives were lived with Christ's return hanging in the balance and and the lives they were to live were to give evidence of that true faith and that true hope that came as a result of their relationship with Christ as well as his return. And so um, here in this second letter, Peter really um, exposes this idea of God's grace in the face of the opposition uh, that they will be up against because of their life in Christ. The key themes are first and foremost the certainty of our salvation, and it is certain because of who Christ is and what Christ has done. Secondly, the certainty of the Word of God, and he, he spends a short but very powerful section on the authority of the Word of God. And then third, that um, God will judge those who are false teachers and they will have to stand uh, before God and give account. And then, again, our hope that is because of the certainty of the second coming of Christ that, that spurs us on and that um, urges us to continue by God's grace in this life of faith. And so we see this assurance of salvation, and this is one particular passage I want to read to you in regards to um, Peter's emphasis here and I want to read from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, 
and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so you see there that specific emphasis that because of the salvation that we have in Christ, we are given this calling and our life lived out with virtue and knowledge and brotherly affection um, are expressions of that faith that's worked out in and through us and impacts those to whom we come in contact with, specifically in the body of Christ, but in the world in general, and allows everyone to know of our great hope and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he has um, done for us and prepared for us in the future. And so just an incredible passage of scripture there. And then he goes on to warn about false teachers, that there will be false teachers, not only as there were in the first century, but as we see today, and uh, that God would not spare them. He uses two uh, specific examples uh, from the Old Testament, talking about Noah and uh, the water that came as a judgment, but also the fire, as he mentioned, Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed, uh, that God in that same way will not spare those um, that are not only not his, but those who would even be in opposition to who he is. And then uh, there's a character, uh, there's a, the, uh, a summary of the character of the false teachers in their rejection of authority, in their uh, licentiousness, their indulging in sexual sins, and their greed, um, as well as their slavery or corruption to sin. And in this warning about false teachers, there's a consistency of God's word in regards to these false teachers. And so in his concluding or exhortations, he encourages the early believers. And what I see as a great encouragement to us today, that we be diligent, that we be studious, that we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then there's the letter to Jude. And uh, this is a small but powerful letter in, in the uh, New Testament canon. And um, by way of introduction, Jude, who's known as the brother of James, and this James is probably the brother of Jesus, so Jude would also be uh, one of the brothers of Jesus, written probably in the mid-60s A.D., with again the idea to exhort believers to contend for the faith, stay true to what you know true, in Christ to finish well and to live right in light of Christ's second coming. And again, some 20 centuries later, we too uh, should have that same attitude of living, not only as examples of Christ, but revealing what Christ has done in us with the hope of knowing he will uh, return and how important that is to us. And so we see uh, some key themes here in the book of Jude, that we're to contend for the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints, um, that God's faithfulness will keep us until the end, and that the life we live rightly in Christ, in the light of Christ's second coming, um, should be that which pushes us forward. So our contending for the faith, our, again, this idea of perseverance um, against false teachers, but even more importantly, that we live lives of truth according to the truth of the gospel, the truth of the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Um, Jude is just one chapter, and so the breakdowns you see here just list the verse numbers because there is only one chapter. And, and the occasion for the writing there is from a common salvation to a contending for the faith and uh, the warning against the infiltration of the ungodly. And 
the explanation that the ungodly will be judged, that God's judgment of the ungodly is seen in the Old Testament, um, even prior to Christ's coming. Um, Israel was judged over and over. The fallen angels are judged. Sodom and Gomorrah are judged. And so we see all of this spelled out, again, as that warning, but also as that ex exhortation that we would persevere in the midst of false teaching, that we would stay true and hold true to the faith that was delivered to us once and for all, as for all the saints, all those who are followers of Christ, and that we would contend by the life that we live, the knowledge that we know, and um, the way that we live our lives for the impact on the world around us, all because of what Christ has done. So I would encourage you to, again, uh, keep up with your uh, regular weekly learning activities. Uh, make sure you're working on that uh, Bible storyline, uh, which is your critical assignment uh, due on Friday of week number eight. And again, want to make myself available to you and encourage and be an encouragement to you if you need me in any way. Uh, if there's any way I can help you in this course or maybe outside of this course in a personal way, please don't hesitate to contact me. You have all of my uh, contact information and uh, it would be my joy uh, to help you in any way that I can. I'll trust God's blessings upon you. I'll continue to pray for you as our course quickly comes to a close. God bless you.